Welcome everybody to the Real Estate Finance Summit of DD Talks. This is the German edition. My name is Christina Müller and I'm working for KPMG Luxembourg where I'm helping our clients with all sorts of real estate topics. These are interesting times. We have seen a significant decrease in the real estate investment volume over the last month. Actually in the last quarter, Germany was the first time um, also affected by the decrease of investment volume. We have seen a lot of sectors heavily struggling with the first lockdown triggered by COVID, especially the hospitality and retail sectors. We still have a high uncertainty in the markets. And right now we are being hit by the second much stronger wave um, of COVID-19. And it appears that we are heading towards another lockdown. So probably the question on every investor's mind is, how is the finance industry dealing with this and how will the finance industry dealing with this? We were able to win some trade panelists with everybody having over 20 years of experience in real estate finance within Germany, but also internationally. So now let me introduce our panelists to you. Ladies first, we have Nicole Jürgensen from the Münchner Hypothekenbank. She's responsible for international clients investing in Germany, Benelux, France, and other European uh, countries. Prior to joining the Münchner Hypothekenbank, Nicole has worked for Eurohypo in Germany and Madrid. We have Holger Schmalfuß from the Berlin Hüb. He's responsible also for international clients, um, providing them with debt for the Benelux, Germany, France, um, and Poland. Holger has worked in London, but also in, in Frankfurt and is now located in Berlin. We are happy um, to have Volker Münch on the, on the panel today. He works for Deutsche Hypo in the investment banking sector. Um, Holger has helped the Nord LB with their uh, recapitalization. And he has also held positions at Hypo Vereinsbank and DKB Hypo Real Estate. Ralf Herr from Hillaba um, is also one of our panelists today. Ralf has a PhD in law and has held positions at Clifford and Chance as well as Freshfield uh, Brookhaus and Lering. Our fifth panelist is Fernando Salazar from Colliers International. Fernando, Fernando has served different corporate real estate finance um, providers and also has uh, experience in the non-performing loan sector. And currently he helps clients um, with finding senior, senior as well as junior, uh, but also a medicine in depth within Europe. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Okay. Um, now, and I, I suggest now let's move to, to, um, to our first question. Um, we have seen a significant um, decrease in the real estate investment volume. So we're also interested um, what you have actually seen um, in terms of the finance volume and in terms of financing, um, especially during the first couple of months um, of COVID. Yeah, I'm happy to take that first one, if uh, if I may. First of all, thanks, Christina. And secondly, thanks to DD Talks for having me today. So, um, I mean, we can, at our end, at Münchner Apothekenbank, we can really state that the activity, particularly during the first um, lockdown phase, meaning in springtime up until, let's say, June, July, activity was really subdued. And so it had a had some effect on our new lending business, which uh, is actually lower towards the end of the year um, as a whole, as we initially starting uh, this year, we had expected it was going to be. So, and of course, this can mainly be seen in the context of a uh, subdued investment activity overall. And yeah, as a result, there's less financing requests coming up. And as a result, there's less new, new lending business to be done. However, once the, the lockdown passed, I mean, uh, activity picked up really fast. And so we are in a position to compensate for all the, let's say, subdued um, activity in spring, but still as a whole, we will not uh, be able to compensate it. So yeah, what? how is the situation at the other banks? I think it's very similar um, to your, Nicole. We also observed, uh, observed in, in March that a lot of transactions just got on hold, but then later on, um, that continued so that we actually now towards the end of the year are extremely busy it's it's actually surprising because uh, back in march um, one may have thought that um, sort of 
similar experience like the great financial crisis would sort of repeat but it is definitely not the the case um, investors keep investing into real estate and um, do actually increase allocations so pretty busy for the end of the year that's for sure how about is it at Halaba? um pretty much the same as you described it um the beginning of the year even when the lockdown was there we didn't see so much of a downturn or uh, transactions being subdued but that changed uh, over the weeks and over the months um, many transactions were delayed or simply on hold um, and as Nicole, as you said, um, once the lockdown uh, was finished, we could see business uh, picking up again. So that the current situation is we're extremely busy. Um, but still, we have a feeling that many of the investors uh, are still kind of in a, in a hesitating position. Um, we see uncertainty picking up again due to the lockdowns getting back uh, into the market. Um, but so far, the year has not been too much distracted uh, by the pandemic, the pandemic for some reason. The one reason is that we had a certain overlap from last year. Um, we had that little breakdown in the middle of the year um, just to, to pick up things um, after lockdown was finished. Uh, and, and now we're extremely busy as every year during uh, the last three months of the year. But um, yeah, we can still feel a certain uncertainty uh, in the market. Uh, in, in terms of the future and what might come as a result of the lockdowns getting back into the market. Poker, how's the situation with you? Yeah, I do not want to, to repeat what, what you have said already. Uh, it's more or less the, the same experience what, what we were facing. First two months were quite busy. Then in, in March, April, there was some, some kind of downsizing, a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, people were not quite sure how uh, values will developing, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, pace has, has uh, um, increased again, starting from, from June, July. Uh, and this is in still on a quite high level as of now. Um, on top of that, probably have to differentiate a little bit uh, to, to asset classes as well. So what, what we have seen is that the appetite for, for retail and uh, for, for some kind of, of uh, not for some kind, for retail and especially for hospitality is more or less has gone down to zero, where in turn the appetite for, for residential and logistic has, has, uh, uh, um, has increased dramatically. So therefore most of the, the inquiries that we're getting in terms of financing, regardless of development or investments is residential development, uh, sorry, residential uh, logistic uh, and partially office. Okay, and mm. Fernando, what are you what are you seeing from from your client side? Yeah, well, I'm coming I'm coming from the from the transactional area, so the only one which is not um, acting or working inside inside a financial institution. But uh, it's it's interesting uh, to hear uh, of that. Uh, and, and on this topic, uh, I would like to share with you some insights of a of a recently published report of our capital markets uh, guys uh, headed by Christian Cardel. Uh, as a takeout of this, we are already seeing renewed interest uh, in new deals, uh, both on buy and sell side, particularly as real estate remains an uh, absolute popular asset class uh, in, in this persistently low interest rate environment, uh, and uh, still with a lot of pressure on liquidity continuing to grow. Liquidity is there, and uh, we see that it needs uh, to be deployed. So at, at, at mid-2020, it's, it's difficult to make a prediction for the entire year. Uh, and beyond this uncertainty, it remains uh, a complex environment. But uh, based on, on our periodic uh, market sentiment service uh, um, among market participants, um, uh, there are many deals that filled the pipeline during the boom phase, uh, which uh, still needs uh, to, to, to progress and to be finalized, um, and that are, are still underway. So we may see transactions volume come in at over 50 billion euros uh, this year, which is a result uh, um, just uh, in line uh, with the peak phase in 2015. Uh, it basically reflects uh, the resilience of the German real estate uh, sector. We discussed this uh, previously. The Germany is seen as a, as a safe uh, haven for, for many uh, investors. Uh, probably this year, more um, 
stable or more stabilized by um, domestic uh, investors, but uh, international investors remain still uh, the strong source for the investment uh, in uh, Germany. So, um, well, uh, we see following 10 years of continuous downward trend, uh, vacancy rates in all the country's top seven cities um, are currently at historic low levels. Vacancy relevant, uh, vacancy rates and all relevant CBDs are well well below. So that's uh, the sentiment which we can provide from uh, from Colliers that might um, be uh, cautiously optimistic. Yeah, that's a good point. And also the, the stability of the German real estate markets is also due to, to the finance industry, to, 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 to products like the Fundbrief and, and um, yeah, finance products like that. But Holger, you also mentioned an interesting point that... Um, there is not much interest in hospitality and in retail. Um, and by looking at the occup uh, occupancy rates of, of hospitality and by also like what we hear from the market that a lot of uh, yields, has, um, rents have been suspended for, for retail businesses. What have you actually seen in terms of, of waivers from debtors? Were there a lot of debtors who couldn't actually pay their debt, uh, debt service because um, no business or no revenue has been coming into the tenants and the tenants suspended their rents and also have some banks um, actually um, used the extraordinary debt termination according to 490 um, um, Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch. Um, Nicole Reis, if maybe you want to take that question. Have you seen a lot of waivers during the COVID phase? Yeah, I mean, happy to uh, to just briefly comment on that uh, last Friday, I was talking to uh, a friend slash a client uh, of mine in, in Spain. And uh, this is just a phrase that really burned itself into my brain because he was, uh, it, this phrase that I'm about to say was really a perfect description of what's going on right now. And he said, there are more hotel in Spain, he was talking about Spain, so, but there are more hotels actually for sale now than are actually open. And so I would say this is the background in pretty much all uh, of the European countries in Germany. Um, I don't know if that uh, really is the case or if it's 50-50 or, or not. Um, Mitchell Wittigenbank does have a very small portion of um, of, ho of, of uh, the entire debt portfolio dedicated to uh, to hotels, but uh, we are up until now, let's look at what we're, we're fine with these, uh, but uh, we're not yet over so, um, I mean, now we're going to the second lockdown and liquidity is running out. Um, and so uh, I think this, this wave that is building up now is just going to really unleash uh, over the next months. And so even if we can state or if um, uh, my, 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 um, my co-panelists can state that as, as of now, situation is more or less under control, I think there's more to come. Yeah, um, as you say, the situation is currently under control, but um... There's probably two aspects to that question. The one is if we differentiate between the sectors, um, there's certain sectors, obviously hospitality and leisure, which are heavily affected. Um, pretty much similar to, to you, Nicole, uh, Hellebard doesn't really have uh, any exposure on hotels. So that is not really a question to which, which I can comment on because we didn't do much business uh, on that sector before. But then there's other sectors which have, in a way, profited from the situation. Obviously, logistics uh, in terms of um, online retailers, uh, food retailers, um, uh, residential. Um, you know, these are the sectors that run well despite the, the, the current situation. Um, the, the situation on the office sector is, in a way, stable to cautious, I would say. We, when we look at developments, Obviously, developments uh, are profiting from the situation also because, or at least ongoing developments, because everyone's anticipating that once a building is finished in one, two, three years, um, that the situation should have uh, normalized. And as Fernando said, um, the, the vacancy rates are very <coughs> low. We see a strong demand for office still. So that's in terms of, of sectors. The other aspect is, um, what effects have we seen so far? You mentioned um, default scenarios um, uh, or waiver requests. We've only seen a handful and we had expected a lot more uh, during the first lockdown. Um, I guess technically we were and still are in an environment um, 
due to regular sorry easements which which came out from from the regulator side uh, but also um, on the bank side there seemed to be a big will of uh, forgiveness uh, to put it that way um, technically in an environment we where loans do not default although we have you know current uh, difficulties uh, overall sectors apparently but even on the on the retail side we haven't seen a lot of waivers um, although we would have been in a position to grant those and we we were prepared to do so but as i said it's, we've only seen a handful um, we haven't done any terminations or accelerations at all um, knock on wood i hope it stays this way um, and we'll have to see how the regulators react on on uh, you know the current developments and and what uh, the next lockdown will, will bring for the future. Because obviously, as anyone else, we expect uh, the downturn to, to, to come. Those are actually good news. Um, Volker and Ralf, um, have you seen a similar picture? Or what, what are your expectations and what are your experience in terms of waivers so far? I mean, it's uh, Volker speaking here. Um, more or less the same experience as, as uh, Ralf was saying, uh, luckily, no, uh, uh, no big uh, risk in terms of, uh, or say, no waivers in terms of waiving any kind of payment defaults. Uh, what we have seen, of course, is some some waivers uh, for waiving uh, breaches of uh, of covenants like like LTVs uh, um, or other covenants which have have been agreed with the clients. But it is something, or, or that there have been waivers which we all could could deal with. So therefore, uh, no reason for for panic. Um, nevertheless, and that's why I was, was saying uh, it's surprisingly, uh, we were closing, uh, we were monitoring the situation very closely and uh, probably had some, some especially in, in March, it was some, some fears that the situation much become much more worse than this uh, at the end of the day it turned out. Um, looking into crystal ball, how these things will developing uh, with the next uh, lockdown, which is currently in place. Nobody knows, but uh, personally, I presume there's something to come, and uh, um, we will see more uh, more breaches of covenant. Uh, probably will see some some payment defaults as well, especially in, in the uh, asset classes, uh, hospitality and and then retail. But let's uh, keep our fingers crossed uh, so that we hopefully might be able to weather the storm. And how are you gonna to, gonna to deal with that, especially given the low provision rate? I mean, we saw the study of Deutsche Bundesbank in November 2019, um, which laid out the risk of increasing um, interest rates, especially given that the provision level is less than 1% of the debt volume. So are you expecting to have much more real estate owned? I wouldn't think so, to be honest, um, Christina. For the time being, the current environment is pretty supportive, um, meaning that the debt service is such, you know, when you pay 1% interest rate, um, unless you lose your entire income from the property, um, so keep the loan current is probably possible this, even if, if rents are being reduced. And then also um, banks tend to underwrite um, loans with a certain debt yield expectation. So six or seven or maybe also five and a half percent uh, sometimes the number um, banks discuss so an interest increase does not necessarily lead immediately into a default at refinancing um, i i do agree with um, all the others for the time being um, we have seen some level requests but not a lot but maybe that is also due to the fact that there's still a very lot of support out there for struggling businesses. So the public purse, for example, in Berlin has been opened and payments being made. Um, but um, particularly when we compare it with other countries like the UK, where you know every week there is a GBA agreement between landlord and tenants or something like that. So it's, it's um, I think here in Germany, um, not comparable to that. Um, it's, it's a situation now, um, but the uncertainty in particular with the second lockdown now or part lockdown uh, remains. Okay, thank you. And um, what can real estate investors in, uh, expect in terms of financing? And maybe also, Fernando, you could touch a little what, what struggles your clients are seeing. Mm -hmm. um, will we see like a 
higher rental guarantees. We will see like changes in LTV, um, in, in, in risk assessment. Um, so, so what are actually the, the changes um, due to the increased risk covered by um, or triggered by COVID-19? Yeah, well, if we, if we are talking about, uh, about uh, Germany, uh, the struggles here um, are remaining in uh, the way um, of um, the expectations of the banks regarding the reassessing of their own loan books. Uh, and uh, many banks are recalibrating or calibrating uh, the, the rating uh, tools, uh, as, uh, as Nicole said, um, some banks uh, have no hospitality or very low uh, hospitality exposure. Some others uh, may have a much higher exposure and uh, they have to put uh, the books in, in balance uh, with uh, the risk uh, and uh, the equity uh, needs. Uh, uh, so uh, it uh, remains, uh, let's say, an, an added um, complexity now for, for borrowers to understand uh, what are our banks uh, expecting uh, and what is uh, the impact. Um, so uh, unexpected events uh, takes uh, additional time for the bank uh, and the experience is that many banks uh, need uh, much more time uh, uh, to uh, get to the closing uh, despite their willingness uh, to, to provide uh, funding, but it, it, it simply takes longer. There are people uh, working on credit papers and reassessing and all this needs um, um, today uh, more time. I think uh, Nicole um, uh, already mentioned uh, days ago that uh, they are looking deeper into the, into the credit risk. Um, so um, um, if, we, if, if we are getting back, asset class has been discussed widely. Mm -hmm. So in the future, non-food retail and, and hospitality remains uh, much more, much more complex. And, and I would like to add, uh, because Nicole was uh, talking about Spain, that uh, the first non-performing loan portfolios uh, consisting with uh, hotel assets are now uh, in preparation uh, from uh, domestic uh, Spanish banks. Uh, so we will see, let's say, at least in Spain, which is a country where naturally the hotel sector has a major weight that due to the tourism will uh, see the light uh, in the next uh, days. Um, this is uh, project finance is, is mainly highly dependent on the exit constraints. Uh, so requiring higher pre lettings or pre-sale quotas uh, will be probably one of the consequences now of the, of the actual situation. So all in all, the fundamental uh, question for banks and alternative lenders, which is how will I get my money back, uh, will require a precise answer by the borrowers, and, and uh, which means a deeper analysis uh, of letting and sale prospects uh, for the project for the project financing. At the same time, uh, we are seeing uh, more uh, alter alternative lender money pouring into the market. Um, um, I don't believe that it will be the solution of all problems, uh, but it will help uh, to close the gap uh, which uh, the banks are now not prepared uh, to, to follow. Um, with uh, lower load to values, uh, we need to close this gap. Uh, and there are some alternative lenders which are prepared uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, all in all, uh, I would say that Germany is again, it's still in a, um, uh, in a preference uh, position with regard to uh, lending and to the sourcing of uh, of uh, debt. Okay, thanks. And then the question I think on the market also is like, what has exactly changed? Like, what are the KPIs you're looking at? What what are the the, yeah, the KPIs or, the, or maybe the cash flows or what are you paying higher scrutiny at? And maybe Nicole, you could start because I think you're more on the on the conservative side. And then maybe Ooh, if yes. you could get get the contrast from Volker more being on the alternative side, that would be great. Yes, because uh, Christina, I mean, definitely we're a very conservative house, so we're far from being an aggressive lender. So we've always focused on not only, uh, let's say, the, the, the lower end of the, the loan to values, be it 50, 60, maybe a bit more in Germany, but outside of Germany, definitely on a, on a lower scale. However, uh, what we're seeing now is that our valuers, um, which is basically um, a subsidiary of, um, of this bank, which is um, thus a company that forms part of the group, 
they are sort of um, implementing certain COVID discounts, uh, which can uh, be in the range of 5% or 10% of their market value, which they fix, because uh, they're not in a position to see, uh, to go and visit the property, which this is uh, waned off a bit, because obviously we can freely around, uh, we can move freely around within Germany. However, um, then again, they for retail properties, they really like to factor in some sort of discount just to, because we all don't know uh, where this is all going to take us. So even though it's a well consolidated, well established property, and so which which still now uh, over the crisis has seen a footfall on the on the very same level, um, and sales also. But, uh, but you still don't know where this is all going to end up. And so, yes, they had better slash in a uh, 10% uh, down on the value. So this is what we see. <laughs> and then of course, um, we do not want to uh, decrease the loan to value level because then uh, we would actually um, sort of uh, punish ourselves from, from different sides, which doesn't make sense. Then again, Münchner Apothekenbank has always really focused on um, also on the debt yield and particularly the debt yield at exit. So, um, and, and we've really done our homework. So I do not expect, um, I do not expect uh, for this to change. However, we might as well, uh, towards the beginning of the year, we might've been a bit more open also to take a look at uh, very well located properties with a short walled, but these times for the time being are over. So cash flow must be really secure. Cash flow must be there. Um, this is what we currently focus on. So yes, I do totally see a twist in our risk underwriting policy. But this again, it I mean, real estate, um, each and every, we all, we all know each and every uh, transaction is, is different. And so uh, we really take a look at it and scrutinize it and analyze it meticulously. And then we see what, can, what we can do. Do you feel you're analyzing the cash flow um, more than you did before? No, we have the most complex cash flow, cash flow tool that you can imagine, which uh, takes like an entire week uh, from nine to five. Um, uh, you have to run through a seminar to really be able to fill all those lines. And this is totally, I mean, it comes close to rocket science, at least from my point of view. But so this was the case uh, before entering into the crisis. And this is also the case for now. So no. <laughs> okay. Volker, what, what are you seeing on the more yeah on the more alternative investment side, debt funds, etc.? Do you see yeah, any I'm changes not. in the scrutiny or in assessing the, the risks? I have to see it depends on, I mean, um, Deutsche Hypo, it's, it's covering or has more or less, let me put it that way, has more or less the same uh, behavior and attitude as, as Nicole has just mentioned. Actually, uh, Deutsche Hypo is a quite traditional lender and, and uh, has probably the same approach as uh, München Hypothek Bank as well. What I am seeing in my department um, that, uh, as I said, the picture is sometimes a bit different, um, especially uh, if you look at some debt funds uh, or even institutional money, there is still, they have deep pockets and, and the appetite is there. So what I wanted to say is from that uh, uh, angle, from, from, from um, that market participants, you see uh, sometimes there's the appetite even to proceed uh, or to step into financings with uh, asset classes, which for example, are not pre-led, uh, uh, where location is not so great, um, but as a kind of, of compensation, of course, they will ask for, for higher coupons and, and, and for higher remuneration uh, if they're going to, to do that. So therefore, what I wanted to say is we do have a quite mixed bag here. Uh, the typical mortgage lending business, as, as Nicole was saying, is, is the same as in, in Deutsche Hyper as well. So we're looking quite uh, intensely on, on the debt yield as well and, and uh, try to focus on core assets in, in only in prime locations and, and stuff like that. Um, but again, uh, uh, some, some questions from, from um, clients are coming in who are a little bit more coming from an opportunistic angle. And they uh, are asking us, look, can you structure something uh, which is implementing not only the traditional mortgage uh, uh, lending, could you also put some, some kind of uh, other financing instruments on top of that, which allow us to, to uh, go for a bit higher uh, uh, loan to value or, or whatever you, you have in, in kind. So therefore, yes, uh, um, the ma most market participants are a little bit more cautious uh, uh, since, since COVID-19. But of course, there are some, some guys outside there who are then interested in, in uh, going for, how do I say, more challenging assets, but they ask for, for higher return and that's a kind of conversation. Okay. I mean, we have seen through COVID, we have seen a, sh a shift in the risk curve. 
right? Assets which have been core before now move to, to, to value it, right? And also assets which have been value at before move to opportunistic. But you're saying it's still be possible to finance these value add and opportunistic assets. That's, that's actually what you're doing and what you're seeing at, at the market right now. The number has, has, uh, has reduced of, of uh, guys or companies who are prepared to finance opportunistic or, or value add uh, stuff. So that's what I've seen. But they are still there. And um, But as I said, um, they ask for, for higher people in order to do that. But that is something which is quite normal, what I have seen during 2008, 2009 as well. That there have been always some, some guys out there uh, who were keen on doing such kind of business, but then with, with a coupon of 15 or 20%. Okay, good to hear. If, if I may add to, to that, um, and of course, Hela was considering itself uh, conservative, conservative as well. I don't think we've really shifted our risk assessment so much, but we've added certain aspects, um, such as sector analysis and as those aspects have a significant um, uh, uh, significant effect on, on our uh, overall risk policy. Um, so in a way, I believe we haven't, we haven't really changed the risk policies, but the way we look at the current development and still we're, we're still being optimistic that this crisis, you know, as sudden as it was there, it, it should go away uh, as suddenly. Um, but for the current situation, um, we, we've added certain aspects to the risk analysis, which, which does have an impact on our lending policy, and it will have in the future as well. So. And, you know, if, I, if I may quickly um, add on top of that, um, I think that's one of the main differences, but, but um, to what we've experienced like um, in 2008, 2009, yeah. basically back then we just didn't know what was going to happen and how long this was eventually going to take. I mean, I uh, was sent to Spain in 2009 and uh, for this crisis to be over, it really took five years. Here we know that, yes, of course, uh, this COVID nightmare is also having a huge impact. However, we know that as soon as this vaccine hopefully will um, be on, on the market, at least this, this is going, this will have to wear off to a certain extent because, um, you know, so it, it's not tomorrow, but it's in a couple of months time. At least this is what I would like to believe. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. It, this, the situation is, situation is not the same as in, in 2008, 2009, when we had a systemic crisis in a way. Um, which everyone knew would take a, a very long time and just a, a very short progress uh, to get out of. Um, everyone is, is expecting currently that this crisis, you know, may end suddenly and, and we'll, be, we'll be able to overcome this crisis uh, in a much different way. This is not a, a financial crisis or financial system crisis, but um, something new, something very dramatic. Um, but the expectations are just very different compared to 2008. Yeah, However, <laughs> if I may again add just briefly, um, the big difference is that now we see what kind of market segments are being affected heavily, which is yeah. the hospitality sector and retail. And we all sense there will be huge structural changes coming up. But again, we don't have a we don't have this glass in front of us that's going to tell us how future is going to, to look like. But so particularly those conservative lenders amongst us are just stepping back from from taking on that potential risk. And this is, again, also a difference. So on the top of that, uh, Nicole, I think it's fair to say that markets, local markets have reacted differently. So they, although the activity in Germany remains relatively robust, uh, it looks slightly different in other European markets, um, probably Poland or Spain being an example where market activity has slowed down consider considerably. It's not our topic today, but it's not only asset classes making distinctions, it's also local markets uh, who do react completely differently to the challenge. Um, yes, may, may, may I add to that? Um, to totally agree. Uh, um, uh, it's of course, it's a, it's a crystal ball everybody is looking uh, in. Uh, but uh, it, it remains uh, critical, the term that uh, this uh, situation will require until getting to uh, normality uh, in a certain way. Uh, what happened is that uh, the um, uh, COVID was an was a accel accelerator of already uh, existing uh, um, complexities in, in the real estate uh, uh, world, uh, which means uh, what's the impact uh, of um, internet sales on retail? 
uh, what is the impact uh, of the home office on the office uh, sector. Uh, COVID uh, has uh, um, accelerated uh, this situation and brought the banks uh, to think uh, to think more about that uh, and uh, to adjust uh, the, the, the risk uh, to the current uh, criteria. Uh, there is again from from uh, borrowers side there is more critical analysis needed to cope with the, with this situation toward toward the bank. That's what we see. Yeah, there was also an interesting study coming out from I think it was Brookfield um, talking about the impacts of of um, home office, and it was drawing a picture which was not quite as positive as we have been hearing in the market and in the first couple of months but then maybe coming back to to developments um and i think ralph you're heavily uh, investing or financing developments so what are the struggles there what developments are still being financed is it still possible to finance a development of of real estate uh, of retail um and hospitality or what are you actually seeing on the development sector yeah Definitely still still possible. Um, also on that side, a difference between certain sectors. You mentioned hospitality. We're, we're not really engaged in that at all. Um, so I can't really, can't really say, but I would expect, and you may agree or disagree, um, it's not, it, it must be very difficult at the moment to, to finance uh, a hotel or any kind of, of leisure uh, development. Um, other developments, it really depends. And we've, we've also, uh, already touched some of the points which which have gotten more into focus, which is you know substantial pre let that's definitely um, very important at the moment. Um, and another aspect is uh, you know a, a word we all like is relationship banking, um, a strong and good relationship with with a development partner. That's that's key at the moment. Um, I don't think my my board would be too keen. Um, to, to see a totally new party on the market and uh, which, which we would um, finance a development for. Um, so these two, two aspects, when we see a substantial and very, very, uh, very good pre let and we work with a, with, a, with a party which we have a very good and strong and long lasting relationship with, that's what we need to see. And then we go into developments as well. Also, depending on, on the sector of the of the of the asset, but as as long as it's um, I'd say office or residential, um, we're we're still we still have appetite for that. Yeah. So it's really a, a deal by deal, case by case situation. Absolutely. Pre letting is, is super important right now, and then also quality of, of um, developers constructors. Yeah, absolutely. Holger, is, is that what you're seeing as well? Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, we have definitely sort of straightened our requirements for developments. Um, residential development in particular in Berlin is a very attractive sector, so that, that continues. But um, on the office sector, we would expect um, substantial pre -let and if possible also a sort of secured exit. Um, but main focus definitely on the letting situation and the pre -let hurdles. Okay, good to hear that. <laughs> um, so then looking a little into the future and we, we also touched it a little and we also like always here at the market, people comparing 2007 and 2008 with today's situation. I mean, in 2007, 2008, we had one industry which, which actually had a systemic problem, the finance industry. I mean, now we're looking at a situation where a lot of different industries are being affected by the lockdowns. Um, do you think we're gonna we will run into a liquidity crisis as well, or what are actually the difference and, and similarities you're seeing to the 2007 crisis, 2007 2008 crisis today? Maybe Volker, you want to start with that? Yeah, I'm ready to do that. I mean, as you're saying, 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, I have been at that point of time with hyper real estate, so I have a quite quite good picture and a, a memory about that. That was in the liquidity crisis, uh, and most of the problems uh, which we were facing at that point of time were driven by by the lack of, of liquidity, due to the zero interest policy at the moment by the European Central Bank, um, which is going to continue probably for the next couple of years. Um, I 
personally, I do not see uh, that we are facing a similar situation as, as we have seen in 2008, 2009. On top of that, uh, what we've always said, uh, back in 2008, 2009, uh, we have seen much more higher leverages from, from, from the loans, which we have given at that point of time. Um, we were calculating the DCR ratios of 110, 120 back then. Uh, and uh, that has created a lot of payment defaults. Now we are talking about debt yields between six and or five, six, seven percent. So therefore, I do not see that we are going to uh, that are facing a lot of uh, payment defaults in the future. What we might see uh, that we have some some LTV issues uh, since the value might be uh, dropping uh, in the future, depending on the outcome of uh, COVID-19. Um, so therefore, um, there is no comparison between the current crisis and the crisis and back in 2008, 2009. What uh, the current crisis reminds me more that is uh, in the late uh, 90s, what we have seen in, in Eastern Germany. So there's a structural crisis. Um, as, as you all know, uh, we, have, we have been facing the longest boom phase, uh, one of the longest boom phase in the last uh, decades from 2010 to 2020. So uh, there, was, or, yeah, there was more or less high time for some kind of correction. This correction is, has now been accelerated uh, by the COVID-19, um, but this is a kind of normal process. As, and this is only as I was uh, as I was saying, this is accelerated by by COVID-19. But even without COVID-19, we would have sooner or later we were facing some kind of correction. And this is uh, this is now the case, and uh, and that's why we have to deal with that. And that brings me. Uh, but again, that's that probably uh, I leave it to to my panelists as well. That leaves or brings us to the question which kind of asset classes might be uh, um, the right ones for the future. Uh, for example, is office still flavor of the month? Uh, or can we, uh, or is logistics uh, something which is more or less than give us hope and, and, and comfort for the next couple of years? Or are we facing some kind of overheating in the logistics sector as well? That is something what we might be discussing in this, this forum as well. Totally agree with you, um, Volker, because back then um, the great financial crisis, I worked in structured finance, so I had also pretty close experience of what was going on. Um, I'm more afraid now that uh, given that a lot of industries are being affected, um, that we sort of enter into a substantial economic downturn and that will feed then through to less demand um, for space, for offices, etc. Um, resulting then in decline of rents and, and values, and that's where the banks are definitely sensitive. But um, for the time being, it's very hard to predict um, if and to which extent that is going to happen. So are we going to see a lot of NPLs, Fernando? Um, no, as, as, uh, as uh, the, panelists, the previous panelists uh, said, uh, the situation uh, differs substantially from the situation today in, in terms that uh, we had uh, previous financial uh, crisis uh, with the uh, banks uh, under fire, uh, while today uh, we may face an economic crisis will, which will leave, uh, un without any doubt, uh, the footprints on, on, on uh, some uh, um, lender books. Uh, but uh, um, in, in Germany, um, it is uh, the case that, that uh, there is, uh, is actually being a playing field for, for domestic uh, lenders uh, uh, during, during uh, COVID-19, but we should not forget that cross-border investors uh, are still uh, around uh, and uh, covered uh, more or less the half of the uh, European activity in first half of 2020 and 2020. So uh, if, if we are looking on uh, interest rates, on liquidity, uh, and uh, on the needs of the investors um, to diversify the, the European and global holdings, uh, uh, um, Germany still remains an extremely attractive market uh, for them. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm seeing that we will see selectively uh, some NPL portfolios uh, come uh, and, and, and being traded but um, not to the extent seen in 2007, 2000, 2008. That's my, my uh, personal impression. Yeah. Okay. 
And Nic Nicole, um, you have worked for Eurohypo. So, so what are the similarities and differences you're seeing today to, um, compared with 2007, 2008 situation? Uh, it's, uh, I think I can just wrap up on uh, what my co-panelists have already mentioned. So liquidity is around, the interest environment is totally different, and the underwriting criteria, because back then at Eurohypo, well, we, uh, we were a lot more aggressive uh, than any of the currently here present banks. Um, so we were also doing corporate loans. And I think just the discipline with which loans have been underwritten and uh, pretty much throughout the entire uh, banking industry are totally different. So I think we're well prepared. Um, the authority has also um, sort of uh, done their homework. I mean, the way that they're uh, chasing after us, um, you know, making sure that we really um, take a look at our portfolio on a very regular basis, particularly uh, taking a close look at all those buckets that might be a bit more associated with a bit more of risk right now. And so I just hope that they've done the very same good job with the other banks. So I think the, the situation from which we're from which we're parting right now is totally different than it used to be in 2007, 2008. So we're actually going stronger into this crisis? Definitely, most definitely. Okay. And you know, I mean, there's just uh, elderly people here on this call, you said, we all have uh, 20 years plus experience. So we've been there, we've seen it, we've, we've gone through it, you know, with blood, sweat and tears, uh, all of us involved. And so um, I think we're also all, all a bit more relaxed and uh, have a better grip on, on, on the current situation. And uh, that's why it, we're more confident in handling it and coming to terms with it. Okay. Um, do you agree with that or do you see it a little different? Um, no, I, I totally agree. Um, a, the, 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 the risk situation of the banks as such uh, is dramatically different from that in, in 2008. Um, and I don't want to repeat, but there's, there's a better equity um, situation. The LTVs are less aggressive than they used to be. Um, and again, the, the economic situation, the, the economic impact of, of COVID-19 is just totally different compared to what we've seen in 2008. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I, I do not believe that this COVID crisis will turn into a um, systematic crisis of the financial system. Um, and as my co-panelists already said, um, this is probably, and it probably will not turn into a liquidity crisis simply due to the high investment pressure still on the market uh, interest rates remaining down low, so I believe the asset class real estate um, will remain very attractive, especially in Germany, with its safe haven um, safe haven uh, discussion. So yeah, I believe we can all be optimistic. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, um, I changed sides in 2008 when I when I moved from law into a bank, I, I'm, I do not expect to change again this time. So. Um, I, I, pr I pretty much believe that um, banks are stronger, much stronger and strong enough to, to cope with it. Yeah. yeah, it's too unfortunate for the viewers that we're really all of the same opinion because it would be a lot more entertaining for them if, you know, if we were uh, having a bit of beef, but um, yeah, it is what it is. Sorry about that. Yeah, it is what it is, but maybe then also... I did. <laughs> when I look at the time, we're, we're almost at the end, um, so maybe if everybody of the panelists could get give a little suggestion or advice to the to, to investors what can they expect how should they prepare um, yeah or whatever you think is important for the investors in this current environment and also what is to come ladies first um, yes so I would uh, differentiate between um you know, prospective clients that approach a bank in order to discuss potential financing. I mean, just be professional, be prepared. Uh, don't expect to get uh, very high loans of values out of it. Um, you'll I need to face loads of questions that will be raised by the bank and just be prepared to um, to answer them. Then for the existing clients, um, I would say this is a perfect moment in time to really um, add on this hopefully already well running uh, relationship with your bank because now in these tough times that's when you really get to know each other and that's when you really get have the chance to to really build something uh, that's going to last for uh, the 
in the years to come. So be frank, uh, be open about uh, any kind of stuff that's going on. Speak to regularly to, to all your stakeholders, be it tenants, be it your investors, be it, of course, the bank. And anything, any problem that might come up, uh, just be open about it, be frank about it, uh, communicate it, share it at, at time and have uh, everybody in the loop so that jointly um, uh, a solution can be found because we're in this together. It sounds a bit techy, but again, it is what it is. Thank you. Who wants next? Good. Maybe I take over. I would recommend three things uh, to everyone. Uh, first of all, to take a midterm view. Um, so look beyond COVID-19. Um, so not losing the optimism that Evacanines uh, Vaccinines found eventually. Um, focus on fundamentals. So the quick buy and flip uh, business plan is probably not the best right now. And um, thirdly, be a good borrower, as Nicole said. That is um, very important for tough times to come to have a very good relationship um, with everyone who has borrowed to you. Yeah, not much to add from my side. Uh, I think the key factor is a good relationship. Um, and as Nicole uh, said, be it a new customer or um, a client with whom I have a, a long relationship, stick to that relationship and, and keep working on it. Uh, and in terms of uh, future transactions, I think sustainability um, has become even more important as, as Holger just mentioned, the, the, the easy and quick flip even less uh, or, or as much or as little as it has been um, in favor of the banks uh, in the past, I think it will be even less. So sustainability and, and a good and strong relationship, that, that's what counts even more in the future. Okay, I will, I will uh, follow and uh, let's say adding, adding to the to the previous uh, speakers, uh, I would say there's a there's currently a, a flight uh, to quality. With, there's a flight to quality, which is uh, also reflected in the behavior of the of the bank uh, of the banks, and and uh, uh, it, it's trending among investors. So prime yields will stay the course. Uh, higher risk, uh, which which are already uh, a factor just in terms of uh, increase in financing costs. Will be more strongly reflected in, in the pricing uh, in the pricings and uh, higher risks uh, will be covered by alternative uh, lenders. Uh, so at least, uh, as I said before, uh, Collier uh, remains um, cautiously optimistic uh, about the future of uh, of the German real estate market, and it's required that banks and alternative lenders remain supportive uh, in this path to the new normal. Uh, nothing to add from, from, from my side. So uh, in addition to, to the relationship, what you have already mentioned, what my advice to investors is look for, for the right asset uh, at the right place. And uh, if something is not 100% fine, then, then please have an explanation and then come up uh, and provide a nice story around it so that at least understand, we can understand the, the business behind that and uh, then to, to, to get the story around. Thank you. So, so we have heard a very confident and, and very optimistic picture here for Germany. Um, thanks to all our panelists for uh, taking the time and sharing your insights with us. Um, also, thanks to DD Talks for organizing this. Um, we hope our audience enjoyed the German and the other Real Estate Finance Summit um, editions. And um, to our audience, please, please feel free to reach out to any of us in case you have further questions and would um, like to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.